up? Okay, are we rolling? It's been really hot in Southern California lately, so this is just my operating state of operation. Constantly moist. Okay, this episode, it's episode six of Subcast, and I'm not in the van. I'm not at anyone's house. I'm not interviewing anyone. I'm just going to ramble for a little bit. And I have some bad news for anyone that frequents this podcast thing that we do. I got a little bit of news for everyone. I, Neil Patterson, I am not sober. And I want to explain this a little bit. First, I'm going to I'm going to light this marijuana cigarette. A lot of people come up to me and they're like, "Congratulations on your sobriety." And what's it like being sober and doing this? And what's it like being sober and doing that? And I just want to clear the air. I'm not the least bit sober ever. Not to say I'm constantly messed up, but let me explain just a little bit. I quit alcohol in the year 2008. I haven't had a drink since then. It's been many, many years. How many years? Going on 11. This fall, it will be 11 years. Neil Patterson has not consumed alcohol. I did take a swig off of a bottle of whiskey at one show in 2012, I believe it was. It was a benefit for our friend Jason Lockwood, who passed away, and I took a swig of liquor for Jason, and that was on stage while Downtown Brown was performing. But other than that, alcohol has not touched my lips. So did, did that count as me falling off the wagon? What year did you take a swig? 2012. I took one swig of whiskey for my dead friend. Oh, no. Well, I'm not asking you. Oh, okay. You're looking at me. I'm, I'm asking the ether. <laughs> did I fall off the wagon that day taking a swig? I don't, think, I don't think that I did because I didn't go out and buy a bottle of whiskey and start drinking it. But yeah, I, I quit drinking in the year 2008. But I'm not sober. And I want to explain this. Um, you know, sometimes I go long periods of time without smoking weed. Smoking weed kind of makes me anxious. Smoking weed makes me think too much. And especially if you go a real long time without smoking, when you do actually ingest cannabis, whether it's through whatever delivery system, it makes you really, 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 really high. And if you're an anxious person, that could cause panic attacks. It can make you think your heart's beating too much. It could cause tingliness in your extremities. And overall, you could just have a bad time. So what you got to do is kind of develop a little bit of a, of a little bit of a tolerance, especially the, the, the cannabis these, these days is so strong. It's, uh, if you have a low tolerance to chemicals in general, like myself, you just, you got to be careful. My buddy, Phil, he, he's got this weed deliver, vape delivery system in a pen and, uh, it's really, really strong. It gets you really, really fucked up. This is like just a mid-grade joint. It's not even really that strong. My, my roommate, Greg, has to smoke a whole one of these to even catch a buzz. And sometimes I eat edibles. I do it basically because my back hurts. I have back problems. And uh, I feel like cannabis lifts my mood. It makes me laugh a little bit more at things. So, um, yeah, I'm not sober. I, I'm high on coffee. I'm high on caffeine. Um, in 2017, I was taking over the counter pills. I was doing like Adderalls and Vivances and I was drinking energy drinks. And, you know, when I had my surgery, I ate a bunch of painkillers. Even I used to buy painkillers just because my back has hurt since 2013. I used to just eat painkillers. It makes you feel good. So I'm a fan of not being sober, uh, escaping from reality. I just don't do the alcohol because alcohol, it, that almost killed me. So that I just, yeah, I, I, it's to the point where I can serve people alcohol at the catering place. And, uh, I'm not the least bit worried about drinking because I'm just done with that shit. I'm done with that shit. But yeah, it's really sweaty. We're in Long Beach, California. And this is, yeah, I probably shouldn't have hit that joint. I'm thinking way too much. 
Yeah, you don't know? Is that the strong one? It's not the strong one. Okay. No, I don't have the strong one anymore. We, I signed up at a dispensary and I got 15 of these for free. 15 joints for free. It was really nice of them. It was really nice of them. But yeah, I just want to let everyone know. I haven't had alcohol in almost 11 years, but I smoked DMT with my friend right before my dad died. Uh, I wanted to test that out. I In 2015, when I met Jim Leahy from the Trailer Park Boys, I was on a head full of acid. I'm going to tell that story in a bit. Uh, also, we're going to play a clip a little bit later on of, sure, you know, I don't ingest alcohol, but I ate a bunch of mushrooms and played a show at this festival called Willie Town. And this was in 2016. We're actually going to play a clip from that because it's hilarious. And yeah, I like to, I like to try different chemicals. I like to alter my perception of reality here and there. I don't do it all the time. I'm mostly sober. But every once in a while, I'll smoke DMT if it's offered to me and if it's the right situation. If um, we're playing on the same bill as the two guys from Trailer Park Boys and someone offers you a gel tab of acid, I'm the type of guy that will say yes right before I take the stage. Um, am I going to do that this coming weekend? I don't know because we do have a show coming up. My band, Downtown Brown, we are playing Willie Town 2019 in Troy, Ohio, with our friends Glow Stick Willie. And this is, I believe, the first time we played Willie Town was 2015. So we played in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018. This will be our fifth year playing this festival. That's really cool. They're, they're flying me out, and we're combining forces. We're taking members of Downtown Brown, Phil Warren, Kevin Dumont, and myself, and we're combining it with Glow Stick Willie, which is Ralph, Buddha, and J-Mo. So we're going to have, there's going to be six dudes on stage, maybe more, depending on who decides to hop up there. It's going to get really weird. It's going to be in Ohio. There are day passes available. I am going to put a link down in the description. I'm flying back to Michigan on Monday. This podcast is going to come out Tuesday. So pretty much this Saturday, we're going to be at Willie Town. If you want to come check it out. Back to not being sober. We initially met these glow stick willy guys, uh, and they're they call themselves hippie metal. They it's more guitar driven, just rocking like crazy solos. It's it's a little bit more amp than your average jam band. It's not just like a this is a jamboree and we're playing the country fried hoot la gobbin blue blobbin and we're just dancing around. They're like they're like all right, motherfuckers, let's rock me. Look, ten minute solo, sure, it it fits that jam band thing. The songs are long, the jams are long, but it rocks the whole time. It's it's hippie metal. And we met these guys in, in I, mean, I think it was 2015, and they invited Downtown Brown in 2015 to play their festival. And at the time, it was called Willie Fest, now it's called Willie Town. And we get there, and uh, we you know we load up our gear, and we're just kind of like waiting around. It's, it's hot. There's a bunch of mud. We're waiting to play. And we, Downtown Brown is on the main stage. We actually followed... The Trailer Park Boys, uh, Randy and Leahy, did their Cheeseburger Picnic comedy show. And, uh, you know, pretty much the whole comedy routine revolves around how they fuck each other. Um, and on the show, it's implied that they're a gay couple. You know, they break up, they get back together, they break up. But their comedy show, they're straight up like, I'm going to fuck you in the ass later. It, it was really strange because... It's kind of like when Ren and Stimpy had the adult version. Ren and Stimpy had the whole, their whole run on Nickelodeon where a lot of the sexual kind of stuff was implied. And then they came out with the adult version on Spike TV where it's just like, they're gay and one's the pitcher and one's the catcher. And, and that's kind of how this Leahy, Randy and Leahy thing was because on the show, you know, it, it, it's right out in the open that they're a couple at times and they break up and it's this kind of love thing between Randy and Leahy. And, and the liquor. But, yeah, the comedy show was straight up them talking about fucking each other for an hour. And uh, so we're sitting there. And it's the whole audience of the festival is all watching the comedy show. And it's, it's, it's you know, a lot of tie-dye. A lot of dirty tie-dye. And people just, people laughing at all of the gay humor from the Trailer Park Boys. It was something else. And so we're backstage... Um, a little before Randy Leahy took the stage and uh, 
I remember Buddha from Glow Stick Willie offered me some acid. And I said, well, I'm at a hippie festival and we're, you know, we're playing right after Randy and Leahy. I might as well just do drugs. And I took a bunch of acid and we played our set. And there's a little kid running around in the audience. I remember doing the David Bowie thing. Uh, Cause we at the time we were covering the doom 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 that within you song from Labyrinth, and there's this little kid running around. I remember just the the whole running joke about the show is that I was gonna kidnap this child, and uh, yeah, the in the whole context of the Labyrinth thing, the kidnapping of the child and the Labyrinth and that song, it really worked. But I'm just thinking in any other in, at any other show. Would, could I get in trouble for saying I'm going to kidnap your kid that's running around the festival? I mean, the humor was definitely thick. The sarcasm was thick, you know, because we were doing the David Bowie grab the crotch thing, big old stuffed package, or, you know, is it not stuffed? Like, is that his actual package? It's, it's huge. But anyway, I'm just wondering, yeah, could I have gotten in trouble? And uh, so that's what I remember about performing. And there's actually an archive.org file of that performance but we're not going to really go into that but after the so so the acid kicks in we finish up our set and i'm tripping i'm tripping sacks and <laughs> we're loading our gear off and all of a sudden this guy comes up to me and it's jim Leahy. it's uh john the actor john dunsworth i believe is his name from trailer park boys and he's he's kayfabe he is doing the i'm drunk jim Leahy. like he, it's a it's a character that he's playing and he's not breaking character but when i went backstage he comes up to me and he comes up to me all drunk being slurring his speech and being jim Leahy. but then at some point in the conversation and i'm tripping balls i'm tripping face he just cuts the act and he's the sweetest, most articulate man. He's, he said, I really enjoyed your performance. I really liked your vocal phrasing and all the... Bah, 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 bah. He even said something like... But then he gave me some advice. He said, yeah, and you you know, when you're all going hard with the... Bah, 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 you could also get make love to the audience. He, he kind of gave me some advice right there. John Dunsworth. He told me you could be going insane the whole time, but sometimes you got to slow it down. There's dynamics. And he's like, you got to slow it down and make love to the audience sometimes. Bro, da, da, da. And he starts kind of dancing around da, 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 and making noises like those are the noises I should make. Da, 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 da. And um, I'm just thinking, I'm tripping my fucking balls off. And then I, and I look over and there's Randy standing there with his gut out to here. And yeah, Jim Leahy, the character, J John Dunsworth, the actor, and Jim Leahy, the character, he turns back on drunken Jim Leahy and walks off. So that was the time, it was at Willie Fest, that was the time where I met John Dunsworth, a.k.a. Mr. Leahy, rest in peace, and I'm going to put a photo right up here of me meeting that dude, um, just tripping face. There's a photo right here. In the photo, I'm tripping face, and I'm holding a microphone that's not plugged in, and I'm going, nah, with Jim Leahy, and he's going, Rrr, as you can see in the photo. Yeah, but he gave me some good advice that day. You can't just go full balls hard the whole time when you're doing a rock thing or when you're doing any performance. You got to show people that you're a dynamic performer. You can go super hard and you can go super... But you also got to do some of the slow fucking sometimes in the, in the seductive... So thank you, John Dunsworth, for that bit of knowledge. And uh, I wasn't sober that day. I wasn't sober that day. And a year later, in 2016, we came back and did Willie Town again. This was year two, 2016. And I remember talking to my friend Kevin and being like, where can I get some mushrooms? Because it's a hippie festival. There's got to be mushrooms floating around, right? Just comes back in 15 minutes. Here's your mushrooms, dude. And then it was about an hour before we played, maybe half an hour. I probably ate the mushrooms 15 minutes before we started playing. And uh, someone recorded the whole show. <laughs> and uh, I actually am going to play a little clip of this right here because I think it's pretty fucking hilarious. I go full like conspiracy theory in doing my bit about being on antidepressants. And um, yeah, sometimes you got to switch it up a little bit. Sometimes you got to switch up your mindset 
and your brain waves and your brain stem and you got to throw some chemicals in there just to throw it off the mix so you can go nuts. If you can't drink, can you just be totally fucking sober all the time? I couldn't do it. Sometimes I need to take a Tylenol, not a Tylenol, ibuprofen. Sometimes I want, I take some painkillers. Sometimes I'll eat a Xanax if I'm fucking having mad, crazy anxiety. Um, I've been eating cannabis lately. I've been eating indica edibles and I've been smoking weed because I'm fucking stressed out. And yeah, so I'm not sober. And this performance, I was not sober. This is Willie Fest 2016. I'm on a head full of mushrooms. And I'm uh, talking mad shit. And I can tell I'm on drugs. I have a lot of my banter that I do in between songs. I have kind of down to a science. I go off and just say some weird shit. So let's play the clip. I'm going to start the clip now. Clip. What do you motherfuckers think of the pharmaceutical industry? What do you think about it? Do you think they're trying to make us drug addicts and enslave us with their pills? Anybody? Do you think they're trying to make us docile so there's blindfolds over our fucking eyes while they're behind our backs doing a bunch of bullshit? Yeah. They. I was on antidepressants for six years. I was on antidepressants for six years. I was on antidepressants for six years. In 2012, I stopped taking the antidepressants. All of a sudden, I could feel my penis again. I could feel my penis again! It was... It was a joyous thing. Yeah. So check it out. I want everyone to listen. I'm going to do a poem about... It's not about my dick. It's a poem about being on pills for six years. Who wants to hear my poem? Anybody? Okay. And then we're going to sing a song about a little green plant that makes you feel cool. Weed. And, and guess what? It cures cancer, too. It's been known to See kill cancer to cells cure, in the body. Man. Check it out. This is the pills thing first. Everyone listen. It's story time. <clears throat> They're sitting down. You don't have to sit. Just listen. Thank you kindly, doctor, but I do not need your pills anymore. It's about time I pick myself up off the floor. Took me some time to realize that it's all in my head. And one day, one day, I will be dead. And one day, we will all be dead. So listen to the words that your grandma said. Ain't got time to waste paralyzed with fear. There's a reason this motherfucker put me here to rock these tunes. To rock this place! To rock your motherfucking face! And that's what I'm gonna do every single day, regardless. Regardless of how much money I get paid. I don't make money doing this shit. I do this because I love it. It almost makes me sad. I can't tell you how long I've been insane. Popping these pills for years, man. Sitting here waiting on the world to change. And could this be the end of days? Realize it's all inside my brain. It's something mean to be okay. So sorry, Doc. Uh uh. No way! I do not need your pills. I do not need your pills. I do not need your pills. I do not need your motherfucking pills. Verse I'm two. on a bunch of mushrooms. Verse two. Verse two. You go to see the doctor. You try to tell him something. You came for peace of mind. But you leave with nothing. Except a little written piece of paper with a script for a pill. Man. Pills for profit. Now that shit makes me ill. And... It's ironic, it's ironic that I'm, that I'm writing this shit all stressed as fuck, depressed as fuck. Wonder, wonder what is gonna give a fuck, half empty glasses will fill my cup. I got friends blowing up and I'm turning green and I realize that it's all up to me to master the universe inside my brain before I fucking die. For real. I can't say how long I've been insane. I've been in space for years, man. Sitting here waiting on a word to change. Could this really be the end of days? Could this really be the end of days? Could this really be the end of days? I'm sorry, Doc. Ha ha. No way. Ah. Uh, I do not need your pills. I do not need your pills. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. But I'll eat a bunch Just of mushrooms before playing a hippie and fest. MT and mushrooms. Fuck you, Doc. Fuck you. We're gonna do a song about the legalization of a plant that can cure cancer. Let's go! Everybody! Yeah. We got our boy, Aaron Armstrong. 
So, I mean, just in listening to the clip and listening to this whole show, I'm going to put a link to the whole show down there. Um, it, it may not be the tightest show musically, but but I felt like banter wise and just the way the neurons were firing in my brain, I was able to make all types of connections that I don't normally make when I'm just stone cold sober. When you're stone cold sober, you sometimes you get caught in doing the same shit, saying the same shit, just going through the motions. And every once in a while, you got to stick a, 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 a chemical spike in those brain patterns somehow just so you can think a little differently. You can diverge from the the stuff you always do i did the the last big tour i did i did the whole thing without really smoking weed at all i had really long drives and i had a lot of responsibility but i could have let loose and i could have changed those brain waves at least a little bit i could have tried to enjoy myself on that run just a little bit and that's what i'm trying to do right now i'm trying to I'm trying to think a little differently, open my mind a little bit, and uh, and relax. And that's the thing. When I was on antidepressants, I was on antidepressants because I, I I was flipping the fuck out. I was I was just coming off of alcohol, and I was a, an emotional wreck. I didn't know what I was doing with my life. I still don't know what I'm doing with my life, but I'm just not going to pour booze all over it. I think. Being totally sober is kind of overrated. So when people come up to me and they, they say, dude, you're sober. It's like, no, every once in a while, I got to put something in there and I got to change it up a little bit because if I, if I was, I probably, you know, I would be a really miserable dude. I need to lay off the coffee. <laughs> but yeah, so I'm back on the cannabis. I took a long, long while where I wasn't doing it at all. But on this last tour with HR, after we got all our work done, I would... I would hit and or eat the weed with the bros in the band and it mellows me out a little bit and it makes my, it. I don't know if it makes my back hurt less, but it makes me think less about how much my back hurts because I start thinking about stuff like, like the floor of the gym that I go to. Does anyone belong to a gym? Have you been to a gym before? Do you, do you exercise? If there's anyone that exercises at a gym that you pay a monthly fee to go to, like an LA Fitness or Snap Fitness, Planet Fitness, I go to LA Fitness because they have a sauna there. And I want to get into a couple sauna stories here. If Have you ever been in a communal sauna where it's a bunch of people just sweating? Sometimes they have co-ed saunas, like the, the gym I'm going to right now in Long Beach has co-ed saunas. So you'll be in there with men and women and sweating, like a co-ed sweat. But things get really weird when it's just the men. When I'm in there with just dudes and I'm trying to get my sweat on, dudes are barking at each other. And you know how on the, during the holidays they say you shouldn't talk about politics or religion. In Dearborn, Michigan, when I go to the LA Fitness there, that's all people talk about. They argue politics and they argue religion. And even if you're in there with your headphones on and you got your headphones cranked, you can hear their voices over the cranked Post Malone or whatever you happen to be listening to in the sweat room. Just screaming about religion, screaming about politics. And I, I just want to go in there and sweat and chill. But it gets heated in there. Buff dudes screaming at each other about which diet is better. The keto diet or diets with carbohydrates. Just screaming at each other. Trump this. Taxes that. Jesus Christ. Muhammad. It gets fucking amped in there. And I remember one time I was at, I was at the co-ed sweat room in long beach and at the time i think i was i was like highly caffeinated i was taking a lot of workout supplements that were like loaded with caffeine and probably taking adderall at the time i was kind of a speed freak in 2017 but i remember i remember it was like a sunday and i was in there there was like two other people in there and there was this man and he's like hey how you doing man and i look at him i'm like okay i i'm like trying to listen to my music i don't want to talk to people when i'm sweating like that I don't want to talk to people. I don't want to make friends. I don't want to have a conversation. I just want to mellow out and listen to my music. 
And the guy looks at me, he's like, he's like, what's, he said something along the lines of like, what's troubling you? Or, and at the time I was about to go back to Michigan because my mom was about to have a brain surgery. So I, I straight up told him. And so this complete stranger, and mind you, we're naked pretty much. We're pretty naked. And this man, he asked for my hand and he starts saying a prayer to me. And there's one other dude just trying not to pay attention to the weird shit that's going on in the sauna. And the man is just, oh God, oh Jesus Christ, please pray for my brother Neil and his mother who's soon to go into a very risky brain surgery. And can we give him the power and your divinity? And uh, I, I, you know, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know exactly what he said, but the, the fact of the matter is here I am minding my own, my own business, trying to sweat. And a man decides to hold my hand and say a prayer for me and my mother. And I'm not a religious dude. So in that moment, I could have just been like, excuse me, this doesn't apply to me. But I just held that man's hand half naked in the sweat box. And I let him say his prayer for me because the, the sentiment, it was a beautiful thing. I thought it was weird as fuck, but it was a beautiful thing. This man took time out of his day to pretty much like sing a prayer, like a theatric presentation of this prayer. Like it's like he had it memorized, but I think he was, I think he just was so used to saying that God shit that he just spit it out. And yeah, I held that dude's hand the entire time, as weird as it was. And then he said, have a good day, my brother, or something like that. And he walked out of there. Yeah, and that's the type of stuff that happens sometimes in a sauna. Flash forward. Flash forward to Father's Day that same year, I believe it was. I was in Dearborn, Michigan, and it was Father's Day, and I just got done with my work, and I'm sitting in the sauna, and there's fucking there's a big buff dude sitting there, and we're all pretty much, you know, this is the all-male sauna. This isn't the co-ed one like the one in Long Beach, and this, this big buff dude, and we're all naked, and we're just sitting here, and he just starts crying. He just starts crying his ass off. And <laughs> he's, he said, I miss my dad. <laughs> and uh, he said he died last year. And he, he said, that was my dog. <laughs> and I'm sitting there because my dad had died recently. My dad died in 2016. So this was like maybe a year and a half after that. And... He started crying and I started crying, but I didn't say anything, but I, I sat there and cried with him. And they tell you a lot of shit about toxic masculinity and how it exists. It's rampant and about how you can't cry if you're a dude. And like, you, it, it is because I played sports and whatnot. It is that whole like, oh, you're crying, you wuss. But you know what was cool about this dude crying in front of strangers is these big buff motherfuckers, they all, they like touched this sweaty man and they said, it's all good, dog. Like they consoled him. He was consoled by strangers. And I just thought that was a really beautiful moment. This is the type of shit that happens in saunas, guys. You go into a sauna, you might have some weirdo pray to you or you might have a fucking you might share a cry with the naked dude about dads and so the guy got his composure you know but no one judged him because everyone in there when you're vulnerable when you're naked and you just you worked your ass off lifting things you know trying to stay in shape you're tired as fuck and you're sitting there just sweating it out afterwards so we're all vulnerable we're naked pretty much and this dude starts crying and no one said, you fucking pussy. No one said, oh, don't do that. These strangers, they consoled this man. And at that moment when I was crying with him, I felt like someone really understood. I wasn't close to my father, but I, I felt like here's someone that I know exactly how they feel. Because regardless of whether or not you were close to your dad, if you, if you have a parent die, that affects you deeply. So, yeah, that dude left the sauna and there was some other dude. And, and I said, 
something along the lines to one of the guys that were cons- consoling the dude that my my dad didn't give a shit about me or something. I was still pretty bitter about the whole thing. And I'll never forget what this dude told me. The same stranger that consoled the crying man. He looked at me and said, do you have kids? And I said, nope. He said, I don't care how tough your dad was on you. I don't care how much of how shitty he made you feel. I have no doubt in my mind that that man loved you. He might not have been able to show it to you the way you wanted it to. But if you have a kid, you love that child no matter what. And, uh, and I, that really stuck with me. It was one of the it was one of those conversations you have where it shifts the way you're thinking about everything. And in therapy too, it shifted like everything. When my dad first died, I went on Facebook and I'm just like fucking scumbag died today. I, I don't know exactly what I wrote, but I went off. And it, it was a public post. There's members of my family on there. They made me take it down. I, I But I was just so mad. That I didn't think for one second, like who the who it was this person and why were the, they the way they were and did it have to do with his upbringing and how lonely was he how sad was he how much did he fail in his life, you know, I didn't think about any of that and I remembered that conversation I had with homeboy in the sauna made me think a little bit, you know he's right he it's not that he didn't love me, it's that he just he's the type of dude that wouldn't cry around naked dudes in a sauna. Just repressed emotions. And so props to the dude that cried in front of a bunch of naked dudes. And props to the dudes that consoled that dude. And props to the dude that prayed for my fucking mom in the sauna. And props to fucking saunas in general because they make you feel good. And that's my what I'm going to say about saunas. But sauna, it's a magical place, man. Either people are screaming about diets and politics and religion... Or they're opening your fucking mind to the possibility of a better world with nicer, more compassionate human beings. Fucking hey. Woo! Yeah! Oh, man. I'm going to smoke a little bit to, to that. How, uh, hey, Allie, how far are we into this episode? Okay, we're we're halfway through. We're going to make this one quick. But anyway, we're coming back to Willie Town. When this comes out Tuesday, I believe it'll be the 10th of September 2019. This will drop Tuesday. Today is Tuesday, the 10th of September 2019. We will be at Willie Town Saturday the 14th. Am I going to do drugs? You know, probably not. I got to drive the guys and gal we're gonna be coming down from detroit to troy oh i built oh troy ohio is that by columbus can anyone tell me that but yeah life is not so bad it's really hot in southern california we've been sweating a lot but also there's a thing called supping in southern california called stand up paddleboard and i did it and i've been doing it i remember in the first episode of this podcast i said sup it's a thing. Southern California. I mean, it's not just Southern California. It's Hawaii. It's lakes. It's a paddle board. And it's like a big surfboard. It's a big surfboard that you stand on and you move yourself along the water. You glide on top of the water. You glide on top of the water like Jesus Christ. And it's a it's a really soothing thing. And it's a good uh, upper body workout. I've been supping. I supped. Was it yesterday we supped? And it was nice. I fell in the water. I'm not that good at supping, but it's regardless. It's a fun outdoor activity that if the weather is nice, you should all try. Everyone should try supping. You can do yoga on a sup. You can bring your dog on a sup. I see people supping with their kids just sitting on the board. Um, that porn star Johnny Sins guy, he has a vlog where he sups around because he like lives in Maui sometimes because he's rich and has a huge penis. You know, everyone's supping, porn stars and normal people and fat guys, you know, and children and uh, dogs and yogis. 
everyone be supping i um yeah i ate a thousand calories before i started filming this is there any of that coffee left can i have some of that beep Allie's right here but i'm doing the solo podcast thing um she's behind the camera and i it's weird because when you get a little bit high you start over analyzing things and i'm looking over at her i'm like is this podcast sucking right now <laughs> Because she looks really bored. And I know she worked today. Her ankle hurts. She works hard for her money. So hard for it, honey. And I'm looking over at her. And I'm just like, does this blow? Am I dropping the ball? But you know what? I don't, I don't really think I am because I think the whole sauna saga that I just told you, I think that was poignant. And I think, yeah, you can't say that everybody sucks. You can't say that everybody sucks because... There are good people in this world. You just got to find them or they got to happen upon you. And you know, you're going to trust people and you're going to think that they have your best interest in mind and they're going to crush you. Mm -hmm. But that's a risk you take by letting other people into your life and no risk, no reward. Like who knows? You let someone in your life on, on a chance and you remain somewhat open to the possibility of good things happening with that person, good things could happen. They might. Or that person might be a, a sociopathic narcissist with psych, psychotic tendencies. There is a YouTube channel where they read Reddit posts. Um, and it's one of those, I, I don't know exactly how Reddit works, but you can like, the question is, talk about psychopaths or whatever like hey hey reddit tell us your stories about dealing with a sociopath and it's really weird because it's a youtube channel and all it is is the transcribed words of the written reddit stories but it's read by this like robot and i could tell that he had no soul when he looked at me with those glassy eyes parents of sociopaths psychopaths or people who have done terrible things how do you feel about your offspring warning this content may be upsetting or disturbing to some audiences. I had my son when I was 21 years old, he was on planned. His mother and I had been together for a little over a year when she got pregnant, I was working at a pizza place when he was born. I remember the first time I saw him, he had big blue eyes and looked a lot like his mother, I loved him from the first time I saw him. I told myself I was going to do whatever it takes to bring him happiness. The first three months were wonderful. I was learning how to be a father and spent a lot of time with him. Times got rough, money was a problem and my relationship with his mother was a disaster, we fought a lot, screamed, I regret those screams. She developed a painkiller's addiction after an operation and there was a constant malaise when we were together, she wasn't the same, I tried to help her but she wouldn't let me. More fighting ensued. A week after his first birthday I found out that his mother had been cheating on me. There was no reconciliation possible. It was broken, I moved out, tried to get custody but lost in court. Only saw him every two weeks. He was a normal child, liked Pokemon a lot, we would watch it together when he was at my place. Gave him gifts, cuddled him, told him I loved him and was proud of him while he was growing up and then things changed. At around 8 years old he became distant, rarely talked, was prone to fits and spent most of his time in his room. I tried to get him to talk to me but it was of no use. I saw a huge bruise on his left shoulder one day, I asked him where he got it, he shrugged it off. Then it was a broken finger, and then a rib. I contacted the police, his mother said he was clumsy and always fell but my son finally admitted that she beat him but the cops did nothing. I finally got his custody when he was 12, his mother took too much pain meds and had set fire to her apartment. She was declared unfit. He was never the same, the joyful child he was was gone. I tried to get him help but he'd run off. I tried to get him to meet a counselor but he ditched the meeting. As he was going through adolescence I was seeing less and less of him, he started to hang out with questionable kids and got into pretty hard drugs. I did what I could to get him out of the slippery slope but to no use. He hated me, the more I told him I loved him, the more he despised me. I found heroin needles on his room's floor, when I questioned him about it he pulled a knife at me, called me a piece of dog crap and ran away, he was 18. He never came back home. On October 8, 2009 I got a phone call I'll never forget. It was my son, calling from jail. Help me dad, they're saying I raped someone. My son had apparently picked a 14 year old from the mall, told her he was some kind of talent scout, brought her to his friend's apartment, knocked her out, beat her and raped her mercilessly. 
He denied, claimed his innocence but evidence was overwhelming. I visited him in prison until one day I asked him why he did it. He looked at me with the coldest face and said I had too much free time on my hands and not enough vagina under my fists. I cried, he laughed. I have not seen him since. And I, I'm i going to put a link down there, but you should really check out this YouTube channel. If you're into any of that like sociopaths, uh, psychotic people stuff, it's a, a, a lot of the people that responded to this subreddit are actual psychopaths, actual sociopaths that describe word for word what it's like to feel that way. It's pretty fascinating stuff. So if you get a chance, check that out. Don't know what the channel's called, but I've been addicted to that at work. And while I'm sitting at work, people are coming up to be a little bit, what are you listening to, man? I'm like, oh, you know, just stuff about sociopaths. A lot of it has to do with kids. Like they, they ask Reddit, hey, are you a teacher? Tell me about having to deal with sociopathic kids that you had to deal with. And all the stories are like, they're fucking terrifying because you know they're real. And unless, these, unless it's just a shitload of people trolling. All, like, But it sounds... I mean, why would you, if if you're posting anonymously on Reddit and you're telling a story about uh, some horrific thing that happened to you, why would you just make it up? It sounds like these people actually went through this crazy stuff with these crazy people and you should give it a shot. I'm going to put the link in the description. I'm just going to say it's Psycho YouTube channel, Psycho, Psycho Link, something like that. So yeah, down there, you can check out the whole Mushroom Willie Fest downtown Brown experience, which I, listening, I listened to the whole show today and that was 2016. So what, it's been three years since that Willie Town. Um, honestly, I've listened to my band's shows. I've listened to so many of them because I've been doing it for so long and there's always live recordings that pop up. But that, as far as my banter is concerned and being on Mushrooms and how lit up I am and how insane my voice sounds, I would say it's top four recorded downtown Brown sets on the internet so check it out if you like downtown brown you don't and that's the, th that's the thing you don't have to like the band and you don't even have to like me as a person that's what's so great about now if something bothers you or if something if you don't like something you can just click off of it you know everyone's so pissed off about the dave Chappelle special you don't have to watch it you know you can be pissed off that it exists but ultimately, you don't have to watch it. And, the, and that Vice article that came out and just talked all that mad shit made everyone flock to go see it. I mean, how, how long after it was out did we watch it? And I remember when I was watching it, I'm like, people are going to be pissed about this. I remember looking at Allie and be like, dude, people are going to be pissed. But um, I'm also, I'm a fan of Dave Brocky, who... In his solo record, he says some really offensive things, too, that I find kind of funny. Um, I, yeah, I would never... I wouldn't use a lot of the words that Chappelle used anymore. But I think part of what he's doing as a stand-up comedian is he's... I, I don't know. I think he's having a lot of fun with his freedom of speech. And I think in this culture... This day and age, you if you say the wrong thing, it can destroy you. But here's a man, here's a man that can't be destroyed. He like he, even the way he presents it, it's it's presented in a way where he puts so much thought into the delivery of the whole bit that I don't really think it's all that offensive. And if you think it's offensive and you don't like me anymore, that's fine. We can, but that's the thing too, is we can have a differing opinion on Dave Chappelle and still be friends. I can't we? Or is this the end of our friendship? Person who was offended by the Dave Chappelle special. Because I, I assure you, I'm a good dude. But I I did laugh at that special. And I also was like, he people are going to get pissed about this. And they did. And now, we sweat in a sauna with men. We sweat in a sauna for them. I'm not sober. So that's the title of this episode. I'm not sober because I'm on coffee. I'm on cannabis. Every once in a while, I take a back pill. Sometimes I can't sleep. I take one of my mom's trazodones. Sometimes I get really anxious. Someone offers me half a Xanax. I take it. You know? Sometimes I get offered fucking acid and then meet the dudes from Trailer Park Boys. And sometimes I'll eat a whole bag of mushrooms and scream at the top of my lungs into the Ohio air. 
And I remember that show too. And I performing on mushrooms is one of my favorite things. I don't do it much these days, but back in the day when I was younger and I used to like getting really fucked up, eating a bunch of mushrooms and singing was the most wonderful feeling because those mushrooms, they they make all the muscles in your body tense. You're like, yeah. And the tenser your abdominals are, the more intense of a control you have over your diaphragm and the and if you listen to the show that i play on mushrooms i'm going my voice is doing gnarly shit and i was listening to it and i'm saying outlandish stuff more outlandish than usual and i listened to it today with Allie, and we went to trader joe's and i just i felt kind of cool because I don't play many shows these days. And when I hear something like that, it was Bobbins, Smeed, Kevin Dumont, Aaron Armstrong, and myself. And it wasn't the tightest musical performance, but man, we were fired the fuck up. We were fired the fuck up and and uh, I wasn't sober. Newsflash. World. Who even gives a shit? I don't even know who cares if I'm sober or not. But let's just get it straight. Don't come up to me and be like, that's so cool that you've been sober for so long. Lies. Haven't been sober. I don't drink. Haven't drank in 11 years, except that one sip for Lockwood. But yeah, not sober. That's the title of this subcast. I'm not sober. So I watched this thing online and... It's this dude, He's he said, if you're a public speaker, you might be saying like a lot, like, 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 like. What I'm doing in this episode, and I'm actually going to go through it after I'm done recording it, I'm trying, instead of saying like, to take pauses when I would be saying like. That is one of his pieces of advice. And I downloaded, there's two other big things that he's talking about. He's talking about breath control and some other things. Also, when I did my podcast with Wax, I, I think I said like a lot because I was a little bit nervous, honestly. I was caffeinated and I was nervous. But what I'm trying to do in this episode is really be mindful of not saying like too much because it makes you sound kind of like dumb like. And I'm not dumb. I just feel that if I'm not filling everything with my voice, people are going to stop listening. But what this guy said, if you develop a relationship where someone is listening to you speak and they like the sound of, of what you're saying and the intonation of your voice, you can get away with pausing instead of putting a like everywhere where you pause. So yeah, what's my vocal rhythmic pattern like in this episode? Is it good or does it suck? It fucking sucks. <laughs> How far are we, Allie? 45 minutes. We got 15 minutes to go. 15 minutes! So yeah, I'm not sober. We got Willie Fest on Saturday, and I'm going home. Mama, I'm coming home. home. Hey, Allie looks so bored. You're not like super engaged in everything I'm saying. You know, we've been together long enough where I can see it happening. She denies it, but I can see it happening. We're starting to get on each other's nerves a little bit. Yeah. It's not a bad thing. It just means we spend a lot of time together. And no, you never get on my nerves, honey. I love you. But I could see how I could get on someone's nerves. If I'm around them all the time, because I'm constantly complaining about stuff, constantly worrying about stuff. And what about this? And what if this person doesn't do this? And whatever. My my heart's beating too loud. I had too much caffeine. My fingers are tingling. Should I go to the hospital? Should I I got too high? Should I go to the hospital? My back hurts. My knees hurt. My left ventriloquial hurts. It doesn't bother you at all. It doesn't bother Allie. What a nice person. She must really care about me. She must really care. Let's. Yeah, I'm a lucky dude. I'm a lucky dude. My mom's still alive. I and I'm not surrounded by negative abusive behavior. I'm not abusing myself. 
a little bit of cannabis never hurt anybody. A little bit of coffee never hurt anybody. Just not too much, Neil. Just calm down. But I'm not, I'm not drinking the energy drinks. I'm not doing the Adderall. I'm not doing the Vivance. I, I can't remember the last time I ate mushrooms. It might have been that show. It was the last time I ate mushrooms. We have some, we have some up there, don't we? Should we? Should I take them? Yeah, dude. Yeah, the last ten minutes of my podcast, I'm like, all right, I took them. Podcast over, and then just like save all the trip face for Allie off camera. Yeah. No, things are good, man. Things are good. People are tuning in. We got gigs. You you know what's around the corner? We never know. Maybe some tour dates for Downtown Brown. Who knows? Who knows? But I'm about to be out of credit card debt. You ever get yourself in a situation where you're so desperate to make the things in your life work, you just throw money at it? That was 2017 for me. Things weren't working. I was in a dysfunctional relationship. I was a dysfunctional person. I was an addict. I was doing way too many uppers. And I had a credit card. I still have a credit card. I actually, I cut it up though. But I had a credit card that had a $20,000 credit limit on it. And uh, man, I wasn't making very much money. I was trying my best to make the band work, but I just started throwing money at it. Started throwing money at it. Started throwing money at it. Money, money, money. And you, guess what? It was money that I didn't have. It was money with an exorbitant interest rate. It was money that wasn't mine. And it was money that I had to pay back. And I remember at the end of that saga of my life, at the end of that relationship, and right around the time my mom had her major, major brain surgery, I, w I was left taking care of my mom and her brain. The, uh, they had to cut her skull open. It was a craniotomy, and they had to fix an aneurysm that, that was about to burst inside of her brain, and they fixed it. So I had to nurse her back to health. But the other thing is that I had to nurse myself back to health. I was, I was just eating Adderalls and working at the catering company and taking care of my mom. And I was looking at my bank account and it said, it said, you're 15 grand in debt. Something crazy like that. It was way too much money. It was a lot of money to be in debt. And uh, yeah, I, I got my shit together over the last two years. I did it. I busted my ass. I got a fucking day job. I quit doing the band so much because I'm like, I got to get out of debt or that's just going to ruin my life. It wasn't working for me. I went to work. I cleaned the toilets. I gave away the microphones. I took people's ID. I answered the phone. I dog sat. I did everything. I worked at the catering company. I did odd jobs. I did drawings. I did a, a GoFundMe thing uh, for the album. I tried raising money for that, you know? And yeah, two years later, I'm, I'm about to be free of credit card debt. Things are fucking good. Things are good for me. But it, even if things are good on paper, it's really easy to sit around and dwell on the negative. Uh, not enough people are paying attention to this. Uh, I, I don't feel like, I feel like a failure because a girl I used to date in 2003 is a doctor now. <laughs> Good for her. You know, she was fucked up. When she and I were together, I was a big fat fucking alcoholic. And she was, she was hospitalized for bulimia and, and, and just in a bad, bad place. She was a very d depressed, troubled person. And, you know, I don't talk to her. I don't know if she is less troubled, but she's a fucking doctor now. I mean, she definitely ch checked off one big thing in her life, which is, you know, job security, being a, an MD. She's not going to have a whole lot of problem finding work, being a medical doctor. So good for her. You know, she she was nice to me at a time in my life where... I had zero self-esteem. Zero. 
And it was a bad combo because she was very attractive and I was young and just didn't know how to deal with my emotions. It was my first real relationship. But she made me feel she made me feel loved back then. And that was nice. That was way, way before I realized that you need to love yourself more than you need to hold on to the love of other people. Like, you know, if if you never love yourself, you're always going to be dependent on that love from outside sources, whether it's the roar of a crowd or, you know, people liking your shit on Facebook or, uh, you know, a woman telling you that they love you or a man telling you or just a human being. I w- it's cliche, but if I only knew then what I know now, I probably would still be friends with a lot more people. But you need to go through that painful shit. You need to, to find out who you are and find out what you want and what you don't want. And frankly, you need to fall flat on your face. Because you need to get back up from that and realize, all right, what do I need to do for me to make me more better? And I fell on my face in 2004. I fell on my face in 06. I fell on my face in 08. And then I picked myself up, but I still fell. I may have quit drinking in 08, but I fell and I fell and I fell. And I got involved with people and I didn't have any self-respect and I was angry You know, he just kept falling, kept falling. And I'm going to fall again. I'm going to fall again. But you know, when I do fall and I start crying in a sauna with naked dudes, hopefully there's just a couple of them in there that understand and can relate to me weeping nakedly in a hot room. Do you think that compassion will exist when I fall again? Only time will tell. But right now, things aren't so bad. And I hope everything is going well for everyone. How how far are we? Five minutes under an hour. Yeah, I'm thinking we might just cut it. I think we should. Yeah. Stretch an hour. That was a beautiful sign I can stretch it to whatever I want. But anyway, this is episode six of Subcast, and I want to thank everyone that's been tuning in. Please leave a comment, like, subscribe, do all that stuff, because it's going to help get the videos better placements in the algorithm. So just fucking like that shit, smack that shit, smack that like, leave that comment, ring that bell. I don't know all the YouTube speak yet. I'm still learning, but... I'm having a good time. I'm glad we did this. Our guest bailed today, and I just ended up getting high and drinking coffee and talking to myself and listening to this. It was a good day. Listening to this old recording of Downtown Brown. We went to Trader Joe's. I took a shower for once. Things aren't so bad. So, yeah, I'm going home Monday. This will come out Tuesday, and then Saturday we will be at Willie Town. And while I'm back in the Midwest, I got interviews, man. I got three interviews that are going to blow your face off. I'm talking to some people I'm really excited to talk about. Because when I started doing this podcast, I was already back in L.A., you know? I, I know some people out here, but the Midwest is my shit. And I know there's so many people that I can't wait to have a conversation with on this podcast. So join me if you want. And... It's fucking 2019 and it's America and this is the internet. If you don't want to join me, you can just go do anything else. You can go to that Reddit thing where they read off serial killer shit. You literally can choose what you want to do at any time unless you're at work. You know, sometimes you're stuck with that shit or you're taking care of a kid or something. But as far as the internet is concerned, it's fucking your oyster, dude. You can watch Joe Rogan clips for fucking days. There's so many of them. So thank you for tuning in. I love you guys. I'm not sober. Sometimes I am, but I'm not all the time. And this has been Subcast Episode 6. Thank you, Allie. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.